Can understanding economics make you a better investor? Surprisingly, this is somewhat of a controversial question as there are many people who believe that not only does studying how the economy works not make you a better investor, but it can actually make you a worse investor. And in this video, I'm going to show you why, especially in this day and age with the over financialization of the economy in this late stage fiat system we have, it is not only an advantage to having at least a baseline understanding of economics, but it is absolutely necessary if you don't want to have your portfolio screwed over in the long run. If you don't know who I am, my name is Joe Brown. And in 2019, I quit my job as a stockbroker. And now I run Heresy Financial University, where I teach people how markets work so that you can make more money investing. Let's rewind the clock a bit. The date was Sunday, August 15th, 1971. President Nixon was addressing the nation on TV about a bold move that had never been done before in United States history. I have directed the Secretary of the Treasury to take the action necessary to defend the dollar against the speculator. I have directed Secretary Connolly to suspend temporarily the convertibility of the dollar into gold or other reserve assets, except in amounts and conditions determined to be in the interest of monetary stability and in the best interest of the United States. One young man who was watching this address was none other than legendary billionaire investor and founder of the hedge fund Bridgewater, Ray Daly. That's who we know him as now, but back then he was actually a clerk on the New York Stock Exchange. At the time he was fresh out of college watching this address and thinking, man, this is bad. And he was right, but not for the reasons that he thought. Reasoning through it, he figured, well, money gets its value because it is a claim on gold. And if that claim is no longer valid, money is no longer valid, everything's going to collapse. And he was sure in for a shock because Monday morning when he arrived on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, the Dow Jones opened up 4% higher not lower. And if you had invested in the stock market on that day, as soon as you could after the suspension of the gold standard, you would have seen your investment increase by 22% over the following 18 months. This was a life-changing moment for Ray Dalio that led him down the journey of learning how markets actually worked because his initial assumptions turned out to be false. And we're not done with Ray Dalio yet because just a few years later, he was wrong again, but this time it would cost him a lot more. The year was 1982 and the stock market had been volatile and had been falling for the last two years. The economy seemed to be on extremely shaky footing and Ray Dalio was expecting a recession, potentially even a depression. Federal Reserve had been spending the last 10 years raising interest rates to record high levels in a battle against the inflation that they seemed to not be able to control, raising the Fed funds rate all the way up to a high of 19%. And unfortunately, this bet turned out to be wildly wrong because over the next 18 years, not only did the stock market not crash, but went on to have one of the greatest periods of growth in US history, achieving an astounding 225% gains over the next five years before the crash of Black Monday in 1987. Over the course of his career from there, he dedicated his life to understanding history, economics, and trying to prove his own ideas wrong. As a result, he was able to grow the largest hedge fund on earth, Bridgewater, and he's written tons of best-selling books, especially some of my favorite ones, like Navigating Big Debt Crises, in which he details some of what he learned along the way, like the long-term debt cycle. You see, the years around 1980 were the turn of the next phase of the long-term debt cycle. Betting on a recession and a crash in the stock market at this point would have been the same thing as betting on interest rates falling in 2021. Now that might seem preposterous to you right now, but if you go back and look at some of the articles from 2021, you look at some of the things people were saying around then. Many people were saying, number one, the Fed can never raise rates. And if they do raise rates a little bit, they'll have to cut back to zero immediately. Absolutely nobody was expecting that the long-term debt cycle had just turned a corner and a new phase had arrived. You see, from about the year 1940 through about the year 1980, the US government deleveraged, meaning the amount of 
of debt it had went down relative to the size of the economy from a peak of around 120% to a bottom of around 33%. This was an inflationary deleveraging. And while governments can deleverage in other ways, like through austerity, which means spending less and taxing more so that they have a surplus in order to pay down their debt, this rarely, if ever, happens anymore. Ever since the invention of central banking, we see inflationary deleveraging happen much more often, which essentially just means they print their way out of it. During that 40 year phase of the debt cycle, this was done through things like yield curve control in order to keep real yields below the rate of inflation and ultimately ended with a boom in 1971 when we delinked from gold and that allowed some additional expansion of the money supply. During that same time, interest rates were rising as well, both short term interest rates like the federal funds rate, as well as longer term interest rates like the 10 year US Treasury. The inflation rate during that 40 year phase of the long term debt cycle rose as well, peaking just like the rest did in 1980. You see, while inflation rises, interest rates rise as well, while the government is printing its way out so that it can deleverage and avoid default. During time periods like this, people who are investors in long term bonds get wiped out because they don't have a rate that is above the rate of inflation. Investors in short term bonds maintain their liquidity and can reinvest in other assets. In addition to that, active investing and especially things like value investing based on fundamentals reign supreme, which is why people like Benjamin Graham, the master of value investing, published his book, The Intelligent Investor in 1949. And remember, Remember, this was the guy who taught Warren Buffett how to invest. But in 1980, the long term debt cycle turned the corner into its next phase. Inflation had peaked, interest rates had peaked, the government's deleveraging had ended, interest rates had peaked, inflation had peaked, the government's deleveraging had ended. And thus began the next phase of the long term debt cycle that lasted from around 1980 all the way through 2020. This was an era of disinflation where the rate of inflation continually moved lower and lower. It was an era of interest rates moving lower and lower with the federal funds rate moving from its high of around 19% until it bottomed around 0% in 2020. Longer term rates like the 10 year US government treasury spent that 40 years decreasing as well until it as well bottomed at around a half a percent in 2020. Now, the mistake that most people make with investing is believing that the near future will be more similar to the near past when most of the time what happens is that it will be more different. If we want to know what to expect into the future, understanding how the long term debt cycle affects the economy is one of the most basic things that we can learn. And as I stated before, people expecting in year 2021, the interest rates would move back down to zero, just could not comprehend that we had entered into a new phase of the debt cycle. And still to this day, most people cannot understand that the next phase will look very similar, not to the last phase we were in, but the one before that from around 1940 through around 1980. And this is because from around 1980 until about 2020, the government had spent those four decades levering up again. As interest rates moved downward, people and especially the government were able to afford to lever up. If the interest rate on your debt goes down, not only can you afford the current payment, but if you roll that debt over to a lower interest rate, now you can afford even more debt and it costs you the same. Add on top of that the fact that the US economy was growing, that means that the US government could tax more. And even though the debt pile, the national debt continued to grow exponentially, the cost of paying for that debt relative to their taxes continued to actually improve. But once you hit around 120%, you're faced with the choice of either deleveraging through austerity and taxes, which is extremely politically unpopular, or you can deleverage through inflation. And 99 times out of 100, we know what governments are going to choose. Now, there's no law that says these phases of the debt cycle have to last a specific number of years like 40. That's just a pattern that has emerged in the past and it could absolutely change. What matters more is the fundamentals that drive the economy, like the interest rates, like the leverage of the biggest players in the economy, AKA the government, the rates of inflation, and most importantly, how policymakers choose to handle it.
it. Which means for the time being, understanding how this long-term debt cycle works, we should expect to see interest rates move higher in an effort to deal with the inflation that will be sticking around, while at the same time, funding the US government through more money printing, causing inflation to go up, causing interest rates to go up, which means this phase will look about like a mirror opposite image of the last 40 years. Rising inflation instead of disinflation. Rising rates instead of falling rates. Decreasing government leverage instead of increasing government leverage. Which means the things that worked best during the last phase of the cycle, like passive investing and long-term bonds, are gonna be the opposite of the things that will work best in this phase of the cycle, which is more like active investing, short-term bonds, precious metals, commodities. But the debt cycle is not the only thing that matters, it is important. I would argue even more important than the debt cycle is watching liquidity. Far and away, the easiest way to watch liquidity is to look at the money supply. M2 is a measure of the money supply that basically takes into account everything inside of checking accounts or anything that could be considered a checking account, meaning you can access that money for spending. You can see a couple times within the last couple of decades, the pace at which the money supply was growing started to increase, but nothing as dramatic as what happened in 2020 when trillions of dollars entered the financial system, deposited into people's bank accounts, and kickstarted the first round of significant inflation that we've had since the last cycle. But what's interesting to note is that the money supply peaked in April of 2022 and started to move lower until about April of 2023, which lines up pretty close to the correction or the bear market that took place with the S&P 500 over the course of the same time frame. Now here we can see a much longer view of the money supply, and this is a measure of how much the money supply has changed relative to how much money there was one year prior. You can see in the past, most of the time where there was a big increase in the money supply, it resulted in a contraction of the money supply short after. This makes sense because as money is increased, it is done so through debt. And when debt gets to a certain point, it can't get paid back, defaults occur, and you get a deflationary spiral that is the correction for the over expansion in the economy and the money supply shrinks again. But the central planners didn't like this. They didn't like the pain, it's politically unpopular, and they wanted to guarantee that they would have a job forever by being the interventionistas that they are. And so right after the Great Depression, people who worked at the Federal Reserve vowed that they would never let anything like that happen again, and they would always lean towards inflation and never allow the money supply to contract like that again. It took them a while to figure it out, but ever since about 1949, we have never seen the money supply contract in the US since then until now. Usually when the money supply contracts, that is a very ominous sign for the economy. But Luckily, the Federal Reserve was on it and they stepped back in. And obviously I say that facetiously. If we take a look at the M2 money supply, we can see it bottomed in October of 2023 and has been moving up since then. As a result, it is no wonder that the stock market has gone on to a record-breaking rip-your-face-off rally. It is no wonder that Bitcoin also blasted back up to its all-time highs. It is no wonder that gold exploded to a price it's never been at before. You see, liquidity drives markets, and just because you see something bad economically happening, that doesn't mean that asset prices are going to fall. You always have to ask compared to what? What are you using to do your measuring? Because there's no doubt, there are some very bad signs that are happening in the economy right now. Whether it's through household debt, defaults, delinquencies, the jobs numbers, real wages, there are plenty of problems. But money always seeks a return. And when money is increased, it usually goes to assets first. In fact, this is the same reason why all the way back in 1971, when the US delinked from gold, the stock market did not crash and it went on to have an amazing rally. It's also the reason why gold did not crash, but it went from $35 per ounce up to a mind boggling $800 per ounce. Because bad for the economy doesn't necessarily mean bad for the markets. And understanding the long-term debt cycle and then understanding watching liquidity will absolutely assist you in being able to make better decisions with your investing. In fact, watching the liquidity change, in other words, watching the money supply increase and decrease, hopefully gives you a whole new meaning for the phrase 
follow the money. And if you'd like me to help you apply information like this to your investing, join me at Heresy Financial University. It's my membership program where I teach people how markets work so that you can make more investing and protect yourself against losses. Link is in the description below. As always, thanks so much for watching. Have a great day.